This is part one of the chapter five summary for the deep learning book, authored by Ian Goodfellow and others as presented on screen here. In this video, I'm starting off on chapter five of the deep learning book. In previous chapters, my summaries went into a lot of detail because I felt it was very important to understand the nuances of the mathematics. For this chapter, I intend for these presentations to be more of a summary, introducing some of the major ideas and terminology without taking the deep dive into all the relevant nuances. I'm continuing to learn a lot and going to that level would essentially have me reading the whole book uh, on the video. So this chapter is intended to detail the basics of machine learning to provide the backdrop for understanding how to work with deep learning paradigms. The list of topics that will be covered is presented here. Note that I won't be covering all of these topics in this video, but they will be reached over the course of the chapter. The authors note that those who are new to machine learning overall might want to draw on some other resources. I may have to do so, but for these presentations, I'm restricting myself to the deep learning book. We start off with the definition of a machine learning algorithm. The following quote is given as a definition. It's a bit of a mouthful, but basically saying that if some sort of experience increases a program's performance at a task, then it can be said to have learned from the experience. So obviously this is still a very vague definition, but that's a good thing. It's a large degree of generalization is in line with the fact that these ideas can be applied to so much and so are very useful. What we'll look into is what each of these elements experience, E, task T, and performance measure P can look like. It's key to note that the process of learning itself is not the task. The task of machine learning is generally not to learn better, but to apply some mode of learning to what is actually the task. How to walk, for example, given some motorized limbs. Tasks are described in terms of how an example is processed. An example is a collection of features, which might be measured from some object or event. For example, the features of an image could be the values of the pixels in the image. While tasks can vary in large ways, there are generally some common categories that tasks for learning fall into. What follows is a summary of each. The first is classification. As the name implies, the task is given an input to output what category or set of categories that the input belongs to. A variant of this problem is for the program to output a probability distribution over categories as opposed to selecting a single one. An example of this task is object recognition, which is fundamentally the same as facial recognition. Deep learning is the modality best suited to these applications. Classification with missing inputs can be much more difficult. Whereas the classification problem originally meant determining a single classification function to apply to each input, the missing data problem demands that a set of functions be developed, which can be applied to different individual features or groups of features in the input example. A common example of this category of problem is medical diagnosis, where a multitude of data points about a given person might be on the record, but going and doing every single diagnostic test for every single patient is not feasible. One way to solve this problem is to boil it down to needing to learn a single joint probability distribution function, which then manages data being missing as opposed to coming up with a different classification function for every single set of inputs given an example. The idea of a problem being characterized by missing inputs is not only relevant to classification, but to other task types as well. Regression is the task of predicting a numeric value given some input. This is similar to classification, but the output is different. An example of this is an algorithm that generates insurance quotes, for example. The input could really be anything. In the case of the insurance quote generator, for example, the input might be 10 values from a driving record, in addition to demographic and geographic information. If the goal is to create a single number as an outcome, it might be described as a regression task. Transcription can generally be described as taking in data in some unstructured representation and transcribing it into disc discrete textual form. For example, the input could be either an image or speech in audio form. Deep learning is often a critical component of such algorithms. The task of translation is another well-known task. In this case, the challenge is in taking a structured data sequence, words in some language, and converting this to another structured data sequence that represent words in another language, but critically to conserve the meaning of whatever message is being communicated. Some of the examples mentioned previously fall into the larger category that might be referred to as structured output problems. A structured output problem is any problem where the output is a vector or other data structure with multiple values, where there are important relationships between the different elements. This type of problem includes translation and transcription. One example is pixel-wise segmentation of images, such as might be used to take an aerial photograph and determine where roads are, or some other identifiable feature. The output data structure need not be very similar to the input data structure, though. An example of that is image captioning, where the input is an image 
but the output is a sequence of text. Anomaly detection is the task of identifying an object or event from a group as being out of place. This type of task is applied to credit card fraud detection, for example. Synthesis and sampling describes the generation of a new data item similar to those in the training data. This can be very useful when large volumes of media need to be generated, but doing so by other means would be too expensive or restricted in some other way. An interesting example is in texture generation for large objects or landscapes in video games. Another interesting example would be the case of providing an algorithm with text and having an output generated audio of the text as speech. In this case, the output is structured, but there is no correct answer. Imputation of missing values is the task of determining what inputs should have been present when they're missing from a data input. And again, this general task description could apply to all sorts of tasks, such as filling in missing pixels from a photo, sounds from an audio recording, missing words from a text sample, etc. Denoising is the task of taking in a corrupted data example and then predicting what the clean, uncorrupted sample should have looked like or to predict the probability distribution that a given corrupted example was, in truth, a clean example. The task of probability estimation is where the algorithm must learn the probability function that describes the space that examples were drawn from. While most of the tasks mentioned previously require an algorithm to implicitly capture the structure of a data distribution, this category of task explicitly demands that the probability distribution be captured. Performing this task can then allow the distribution generated to be used to solve other problems as well. In practice, however, there are limitations to doing this based on the math that can be performed with the generated probability function. Computing the probability function might sometimes be impossible. So again, we're moving through the definition of machine learning, and now go from describing tasks that an algorithm should perform to the measure of performance describing their effectiveness. For some tasks, such as classification, the performance measure is the accuracy of the program. It might be equivalently called the error rate, which might also be referred to as the expected 0-1 loss, because loss is 0 if an object is classified correctly, and 1 if classified incorrectly. Naturally, the process is different if the success of the result is not binary. For density estimation, for example, the most common approach is to report the average log probability that the model assigns to some examples. Taking the logarithm of the probability creates a scenario where minimization is the goal, since for values between 0 and 1, the larger the value, the smaller the result of the logarithm will be. And so minimization is desired as a means to bring the performance measure near to 1. It also amplifies the difference between values, since the log function is much smoother between 0.5 and 1, for example, than it is between 0 and 0.5, where it has a vertical infinite asymptote at 0. Depending on the task, a different target value might then be desired. For example, if the true probability distribution is known, the performance measure might be the minimization of the delta between the computed distribution and the true distribution. In this way, different performance measures might be built off of a computed probability distribution, depending on the task. At this point, it's also worth mentioning the idea that test data, on which performance measures are taken, is distinct from training data. This ensures that testing on an algorithm is actually testing its ability to generalize. Also, the choice of performance measure is not always straightforward, and the design of the performance measure can be subjective. For example, for a regression task, should a system be penalized more for frequently making medium mistakes or for very rarely making large mistakes? The design choice usually depends on the context and on the application. In other cases, it's possible that the best value to measure is known, but can't be measured effectively or feasibly. This is the case frequently in the context of density estimation, where actually computing a probability value for each point in an enormous solution space is not possible. When this is the case, an alternative criterion for measuring performance must be designed, or an approximation to the desired criteria can be taken. The last component of the definition of machine learning was the experience that the algorithm has. The categories of supervised and unsupervised learning are defined by the experience the algorithms have. One question to ask related to training is whether or not an algorithm is allowed to experience an entire data set, a data set being a collection of examples or data points. Unsupervised learning algorithms are given data with many features then learn the useful properties of the structure of the data set. Supervised learning algorithms experience a data set containing features, where each example is given a label or target. For example, an algorithm might be provided with a set of animal photos, where each is labeled with the animal name, and then it learns to categorize any new photo according to those labels it has seen. 
Roughly, the difference between the two modes can be understood as being that unsupervised learning attempts to learn the probability distribution of the possible input space, while supervised learning attempts to learn to predict a label from an input, so it learns a conditional probability distribution. These definitions are not hard and fast, and the line between the two can be blurred. For some problem formulations, an unsupervised learning problem could actually be broken down into a number of smaller supervised learning problems. Nonetheless, the labels provide a useful tool for categorization of tasks, or learning paradigms. Other variants on the learning paradigm exist. Semi-supervised learning has examples where some are labeled and some are not. In multi-instance learning, an example is a set of objects instead of just a single object, and the set is the labeled item for training with its label indicating whether or not the set contains an instance of an item of interest. A data set need not be strictly fixed either. An example of changing this aspect of the learning is reinforcement learning. These algorithms interact with an environment, creating a feedback loop between the system and its experiences. The authors note that this class of learning is outside the scope of the text. Regardless of what learning mode is used, a data set is experienced, and a data set is a collection of examples, with each example being a collection of features. Datasets are often described with a design matrix. This is simply a matrix containing all the information in the dataset. Specifically, each row can corresponds to one example and each column to one feature. In this way, a single table encapsulates all the data. This only works for data items that can be described as vectors that are always of the same size. This isn't always the case though, such as when a translation learning system has text samples of different size, or a machine vision system has photographs of different sizes. In this case, set notation can be used. In the case of supervised learning, datasets need to be accompanied by the extra label information for each example. In those cases, a label vector is often used which is apart from the data matrix but has each element corresponding to a data item. The label itself could be more than just a single number though. For example, in a translation system, the label will be the sequence of words as properly translated. This data can then be stored in a set. As with the ideas of supervised and unsupervised learning, the taxonomy of datasets or experiences is not rigid. To concretize these ideas, the authors present a simple example of machine learning using linear regression. This problem is approached from the machine learning perspective, so the task, experiences, and performance measure must be defined. The task is that the linear regression problem entails taking in a vector of inputs and yielding a single number output. Specifically, this is done by multiplying each input by a weight value and then summing them, which is represented by the matrix multiplication here. The weights are parameters, the variables that are subject to change in the learning process. When it comes to the experience, say we have a design matrix of n example points that will not be used for training, only for evaluation, since there is also a vector of targets providing the proper output for each input. The performance measure will be mean squared error. Based on this measure, improvement means minimizing the measure. It's optimal at zero. Since we want the performance measure to be zero, we can optimize by taking the gradient of its function and setting that equal to zero to determine through an algebraic algorithm what weight values minimize the error. You can see textbook page 107 for the evaluation of the optimization algebra. This process creates what's called the normal equations, which are a simple learning algorithm to determine the expression for the parameters, the weight values, that will provide an optimal performance measure. In the example presented, the data points have only one feature, the x-coordinate, with the y-coordinate being the target. Since they have only one feature, there's also only one parameter, the weight factor, or multiplier, for x. Most would recognize the classic linear function as having two parameters, the slope and the y-intercept of the line. That type of linear function is actually an affine function. This situation can be handled by adding an extra feature to each data point, which is always set to 1. This way, in the final formulation, the new parameter, a weight, is multiplied by 1 and added to all the data points. This effectively accomplishes the objective of creating a displacement value for each point. This algorithm is very simple and limited, but it demonstrates the three basic principles. We'll go deeper in future sections. Thanks for watching and take care.